has been associated with JSKC for about many years from the time we started JSKC. And uh, second in line would be Dr. R. Pandey uh, from uh, University Hospital of Leicester, UK. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Pandey doesn't need an introduction. We have read through his papers and he has been constantly coming to India, teaching us right from about, I think, I have already seen him for past decade, <laughs> for the last past 10 years. And uh, yes, for letting uh, my age out. <laughs> 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 no, I think you've been looking younger by the uh, last decade. Okay, so uh, he'll be speaking on irreparable calf tears. Uh, Dr. Uh, Shirish Pathak, uh, is he here now? Yeah, he is. Yeah, Dr. Shirish, uh, uh, yes, uh, he, he is a good friend, senior colleague from Pune and uh, is a shoulder and knee surgeon with a lot of uh, uh, expertise on shoulder as well. And uh, he has been uh, working at the Sancheti as well as the Nanath Mangeshkar Hospital in Pune. Uh, Dr. Kapil Kumar is a very senior shoulder surgeon from Wooden Hospital, Aberdeen. And uh, same, uh, I have uh, know him personally and have been associated with him for long now. Uh, he will be speaking on subscap tears and biceps pathology. And I think uh, all of the speakers also have published uh, recently a lot of papers. They can throw some light if we have some more time. That includes Dr. Ramakant, uh, Dr. Radhakant Pandey and Dr. Uh, Kapil Kumar as well. Uh, our uh, fourth speaker, Dr. Ramankant Agarwal, uh, is uh, from the Medanta Medicity Gurgaon and has got a lot of uh, expertise uh, on his back. Uh, from his days in UK and now uh, with us in Delhi and is, uh, from the Medan. I think uh, from here on, uh, we would like to uh, invite our first speaker, Dr. Abik Kar. Uh, Dr. Abik, are you ready? Dr. Abik, are you able to hear me? Dr. Abik, you need to unmute yourself. I think we can set up a message if he's not able to hear us. Uh, Dr. Ashok, are you able to uh, send a message across? Vishwadeep, I'll do that. We can see his screen. Yeah, we can see the screen. Vishwadeep. Yeah, so I think uh, if we, we are having issues, on. yeah. Then can we uh, invite our second speaker to start uh, before? He has to unshare his screen. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, we, we can, can hear you. you. Yeah, so some, something went on with my, sorry. Dada, now we can see you as well. Great. Uh, so how many of you guys got your vaccines? So we can yeah. have show of hands. <laughs> Good 
So which ones? I said not yet. After the vaccine, I got fever and severe myalgia, sore throat. Oh no no! Don't worry, Abhi. We can't infect you on Zoom. <laughs> which one did you get, Abhi? Same Oxford one. We we don't have many choices. No, because I have had two doses of the Pfizer one, and I had my second dose two days ago. And boy, yesterday I was knocked out. <laughs> I think the second do- dose is kind of worse. Yeah, my second dose knocked me out yesterday completely. Com- yesterday, day and night were a complete wipeout. I could not sleep the whole night. My algia, temp fever. So, <laughs> is that hot fever who joined the theaters in your department? So, what did you say? Uh, how much fever did you have, Doctor Kapil? I don't know, man. I don't. I you know what? I don't have a thermometer at home, but it was. I was sweating through the night. Okay. That is the effect of and your before, wife. Before next... Pande make before Pande makes any jokes about hot flushes, etc. He's <laughs> speaking from personal experience. Maybe he'll send me his patches as well. <laughs> Doctor Avik, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Can you see my screen? uh we can see you on the screen but you have to share your screen i did share my screen you have to first unshare then then share again because uh you had first shared it and there was some issue probably and that is why yeah now we can see it coming okay yeah so now it's visible your screen is visible <laughs> Okay, great. So, uh, uh, Rajiv had uh, asked me to you know, show some cases, uh, but unfortunately, most of my files have got corrupted. So, I picked up some still pictures from here and there. And uh, as we know, bony bank art actually forms just three percent of the classic uh, anterior dislocation, and some of the glenoid fractures are actually mistaken for uh, bony bank art. And <clears throat> so, before we um, talk about bony bank art. Uh, the things we should keep on our mind are is it an acute uh, dislocation causing a bony bank cut or is it when it comes to you the patient had multiple dislocations and it has a chronic old healed bony bank cut something like this these are things we need to keep in our mind uh, what we need to differentiate is the idebug 1 and 2 the one more importantly because these are classified actually as glenoid fractures uh, history may differentiate these fractures the patient sometimes will do that he never had a dislocation so far and the reason we need to identify this because in a classic bony bank cut this is what happens you see the labrum also torn with it there's a stretched out labrum the whole ighl the mvhl is stretched out so apart from the fracture it's a ligament or capsulus laxity also which needs to be addressed in such cases and bigliani gave this uh, very simple classification i don't know whether it holds true or not uh about uh, type 1 2 and 3 where 12 5% is this small fragments there and between 12.5 and 25% are these moderate size fragments and greater than 25 are these big large uh, fragments there <clears throat> and uh, just to this is the most important slide so people ask me what should we do in such cases now in type 1 i think arthroscopy is the gold standard now uh because it is actually like a simple bank art uh, tear there the type 2 of course many would like to do open surgery and some would like to do an arthroscopic surgery and the type 3 ones are the big fragments i personally would definitely go for open uh, repairs open fixation and repairs for these fractures there uh, <clears throat> one of the ways of identifying old chronic uh, bony bank arts is this mid range instability of course in acute cases won't be able to examine them properly a bony apprehension test is a mid range 45 degrees abduction and uh, the patient actually becomes apprehensive in this slight abduction and external rotation there uh, uh, the west point view because many uh, medical colleges still don't have access to urgent cts uh, in our hospital most of the hospitals will of course get you a ct scan urgently but in some cases a simple axillary will will give you the size of your fragment there so you know if it's a big fragment there you probably would uh, post him for surgery in a day or two now when we are deciding on the treatment what we need to consider again is is it an acute fracture is it a chronic injury what is the size of the injury is there an accompanying hill sacks lesion 
and what are your skill levels uh, if you are a trauma surgeon and you are conversed uh, to doing open reductions of glenoid and this many of these surgeons can actually tackle these uh, rim fractures and glenoid dislocation uh, sorry the bony bankers pretty well so <clears throat> you should be conversed in open as well as uh, arthroscopic skills uh, this is what i do and i am sure many of you also do this is an acute uh, repair uh, standard three anchor technique one anchor goes below the fragment one anchor goes above the fragment sometimes the fragment is so small that you need not actually go through the fragment you just need to put one anchor below and above make sure you take adequate bites of the capsule and the labrum complex there <coughs> and uh, uh, this is just a schematic you never get to see these pictures there uh, in a, this is just to explain that how these are tied there i'm not showing you details of because this is just like a standard bank card repair there i tried this bridge uh, technique a couple of times uh, the difficulty i find in putting this anterior neck anchor there i'm sure many of you are conversant with this technique it's a kind of a bridge technique gives better fixation of this fragment uh, compresses better it's expensive because you need one knotted and one knotless anchor for this uh, so you imagine probably your cost of the surgery will go almost double especially in india <coughs> and uh, Oh, one anchor goes at the neck this is the anchor which is gone with the threads come out and you go over the labrum and ram it into the rim of the uh, the anterior face of the glenoid so using two anchors you are putting back the fragment into its place <clears throat> the biggest challenge i'm sure all of you uh, face is trying to pass uh, under this fragment and and if you're using too much force you actually this is cancellous bone you can actually make a hole into the bony fragment there and come out so take a take a time and i personally feel the anterior viewing portal is better for these so you probably need to switch your portals when you're doing these bony bank cut repair you get to see it better you can see the reduction in a better way and you can see the passage of the sutures and the uh, devices in a better way <coughs> and uh, this is of course a no brainer because an acute repair definitely Uh, fares better than a chronic repair and literature uh, proves proves the same and so if you find a bony banker do not hesitate uh, to offer them surgery at the earliest except there are a couple of uh, exceptions probably in an elderly patient or sedentary workers you may not offer them surgery immediately <laughs> so this is what the results are if you do an acute uh, repair the results are good in almost 95% this is the gist of the paper which i showed yes uh, the previous slide and the chronic cases of course they don't do so well the, this is arthroscopic repair not uh, latarge or open repair there <clears throat> this is one case where the approximate area of defect was uh, 17% where an open reduction was offered uh, it's a very simple surgery you just need to split the subscap go in you may want to put in couple of anchors uh, to tighten the capsule but i've seen this is just double breasting the capsule like a capsulography does uh, most of the job uh, <laughs> in such cases and this is a large fragment and i would definitely go for an open reduction in such cases of course i've seen uh, people doing marvelous arthroscopic repairs in such cases and definitely requires a different level of skills for these i would not recommend for the average arthroscopic surgeons to attempt these surgeries there because end of the day you want a proper fixation for these fractures not a couple of anchors there at the wrong places there <clears throat> and uh, i still do latarge for many uh, chronic cases and uh, in the last decade we have seen a shift towards latarge and i am also shifted towards latarge where the slightest doubt i would offer a latarge than trying to attempt a chronic bony bank cut repair and even in acute cases i had to do only two such cases where uh, the combination was uh, beyond repair there so i had to put a latarge in such cases there and this is one case i was discussing like uh, <clears throat> sedentary people you have a bony bank card there and uh, first time dislocator i tend to go slow i will not offer surgery for them and uh, many of them actually will not require surgery uh, you can see this is left sided shoulder so uh, this patient went on to have a very stable shoulder at the the end there now we discuss this in many of the meetings and uh, this is another area you will get to see a classic bony bank cut uh, a post postage stamp kind of lesion there uh, i personally would go and do a uh, latarge then trying to refix it back to its position because i feel this whole area is a vascular there what i've seen people 
doing arthroscopic repair also in such cases. This is kind of my last slide, and uh, <clears throat> this is what I did for one of these patients. And I this I'm not going to show the result after a year because ended up with uh, chondrolysis. You can see the nice proud screw there, and uh, the head rubbed on this, and uh, this patient is still going around the country trying to get an answer. He's 33 years old. I would strongly recommend not to do an arthroscopic uh, fixation uh, for these cases uh, uh, because I still feel an open fixation does a better job there. <laughs> so uh, you have to think out bony bank art. Of course, again, three percent of your cases. If you can identify the size, uh, CT scan is very important. And uh, small fragments, I would definitely go for an arthroscopic repair. And if it's a moderate size, I would. Uh, think of arthroscopic or open, depending on what I'm comfortable with. And uh, large uh, fragments definitely are open fixation. It's a chronic bony bank art. A latarge uh, is more favorable than arthroscopic surgery in my hand. And in acute fractures and postage stamp, I would definitely offer a latarge procedure. Uh, Dr. Abhik, I just uh, uh, ask you a question. Uh, if you have a small healed bony bank art, a still patient have a dis history of dislocation, uh, what should be the approach? How you are going to uh, manage this? You can hear me, uh, Dr. Abhik? You're asking me or BD? Yeah, no, you, I am asking to you. Okay. Yeah, so that classifies as a healed chronic uh, bony bank art. Then we go for our bone loss. Uh, so I, I, so many of these fragments actually go and heal on the neck side. And uh, uh, during my arthroscopic surgery days, uh, I would say that I would probably go in and try and refracture that fragment and put it back to its place. But lately, I have shifted going towards straight away to an lethargy surgery. So, uh, if it's a really small fragment, then maybe I can think of a arthroscopic surgery. But then I would tilt towards lethargy. Uh, don't you think so? When you start releasing that that, uh, that fragment and it's fragment is small, it does, doesn't exist because it gets so osteoporotic. Then putting back again. Uh, what is opinion of other panelists, Doctor Kapil? Uh, how you uh, do that? Yeah, I think so. The issue, if you say it's a very small bony bank art, bony fragment, which is mal united, as Abhik says, you know, in, invariably they will sort of heal a bit more medially. If it is such a small fragment, then the problem is a soft tissue issue. It's a recurrent instability due to, as Abhik said, it's a capsular labral complex issue. With it has got stretched, so I would deal them deal with them as a soft tissue procedure and mobilize. The, if I can mobilize the fragment with the labrum, I'll reattach it. Otherwise, I'll just do a soft tissue procedure. But if the fragment is a bit bigger, where you are now getting into the bone loss of more than 16, 17%, then I'll have a very low threshold of going to a lateral and not bother with an arthroscopic fixation. I think trying to mobilize that fragment is sounds very attractive and sexy in some videos, but I don't think you can replicate it every time. So for a reliable operation, I will do a lateral but if it's a very small fragment, then let's do a soft tissue procedure. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. If I'm right, uh, if it is a small fragment, you just, uh, if it is not possible to mobilize, you just do a capsular plication. That's all. Yeah, just just do a, uh, you know, your, your uh, what you call as a bank card procedure or an arthroscopic yeah. stabilization, which is just not reattachment of the labrum. It is pulling up the capsule, doing a capsular shift and reattaching the labrum. So that is what I, I would do. Okay, uh, Kunal, you want to ask something? And you can add on. Can I yes, ask? Dr. Abhik, that was a uh, that was a very good. appreciate your uh, uh, showing off of the spectrum of cases. My, I have two questions to ask. First is many a times in this type of bony bank art lesions, what we find is that uh, as shown in the figure, because today we are most of the time using all suture anchors, then we are not able to introduce those anchors into the bed of the fracture and they sometimes pull through. So the query is whether you actually introduce your anchors into the bed of the fracture or, 
or you introduce on the face of the glenoid because you know sometimes i have pulled through when i introduce those anchors into the bed of the fracture yeah so uh, when you put a very interesting point i mean last couple of uh, years when we using this uh, all suture anchors i find my reduction of bony bank cards not good previously with those uh, screw in anchors you know metal anchors i would find my reduction techniques were better off so uh, so what i have started doing is i have started shifting my placement of my anchor more towards the neck uh, if i'm doing an all suture anchor first number one i get a better quality of bone there it's more uh, cortical than cancellous and some way i can shift it up uh, better compared to that so i'll probably go more towards the neck neck side in such cases any inputs from any other uh, panelist can i ask a question uh abik sorry can you hear me yeah i can hear you so one of the things uh, i don't know maybe you mentioned it i also look at what activity level or sporting level of the patient is so even if there is a very small bony bank card uh if the guy is sort of an elite sportsman who who is doing a lot of contact sports say even football or wrestler there would you try an arthroscopic repair or you may go to a lathage straight away even if the bony bank card is small yeah absolutely so i did on a, the same thing i discussed with a medical student fifth year medical student and i offered the same thing small bank card but he's into active sports and uh, he's into adventure sports and he loves paragliding and all that so he just he selected that you know let, let's do a latarja and i offered him latarja in such case so completely i completely agree with you so uh, last uh, at last uh, uh, the alps uh, shoulder course of nse uh, we had a talk of dr jill swals and what he was saying that he has stopped doing uh, bank cart repairs in all of his patients whatever whether there is a 0% bone loss and he does latages in all of his patients that was surprising of course for me but that's what uh, the people are following there i don't know about the rationale just sharing my uh, uh, i think that's an no, overkill we can we can we can, uh, we can uh, get the opinion of our faculty also uh, sir pandey sir what is your uh, how take on on this statement well anybody who says all the time every time you know orthopedics is this sort of pushing his boat a bit too far so you got to the arthroscopic bank cards repair is a very good operation in the right patient lathage is a very good operation in the right patient so you have to tailor your surgery on the patient's need rather than what you practice uh, on every patient he may be dealing with rugby players or people who are high sporting elite athletes so that is right for what he is he does but in india many people are not elite athletes and they may have a bank cards lesion or a small bony bony bank cards who are quite sedentary in the in the outlook uh, there you can do an arthroscopic bank cards repair uh, and reserve your lathage for bigger bony bank cards or um someone who is very very active of a revisions if it fails once then you can second time you can do it so i think it's all or none doesn't work in orthopedics that's my opinion i think that that brings to the i, I agree with pandey sir's view on that and that brings to the dr abix uh, one of the slides which show that in the chronic uh, bony bank cart lesion arthroscopic bank cart has a failure rate around 40% while uh, most of our arthroscopic surgeons in india who are operating majority chronic bony bank cards only very few acute bony and with grace of god probably the failure rate if uh, i am i am not sharing the published data but when we share with uh, uh, peer discussion it is around 20% i think the main factor is patient factor because our patients are very much obedient and probably they are less sports prone so rather than giving credits to the surgeons i think the patients who are more obedient and less active that is giving us more uh, stable results of arthroscopic bank card uh raman sir yeah say something okay. raman Na, yeah there is a very interesting paper uh, <clears throat> and in fact the uh, injury severity index has been modified by decomo in italy and he has come up with gtims 
and I have been following this for last six months or so since the time I read it. And this paper is precisely it explains the instability. I mean, especially the bipolar instability, and it also tells you how to avoid unnecessary lethargy. Lethargy is not a panacea for everything, and lethargy is a very dangerous operation. Um, uh, and I don't know why, but. probably after letter j people think that they can do anything and they started lifting weights couple of my letter j is dislocated in 6 months time because they were lifting 60 kilos overhead 80 kilos overhead because that's how i told them the letter j is a very safe surgery with a failure rate of 1% which is in hands of jill walsh but the complications of letter j uh, the long term complications are really quite high so we shouldn't take letter j uh, uh, as as easily as we tend to secondly uh, this this paper tells you how to avoid unnecessary lethargy especially when you take into account the bipolar lesion so uh, and this makes sense because uh, all the criteria in the injury severity score by pascal bolu was uh, patient characteristics and all he has done is he's added the ct of the glenoid bone loss and the ct of the hilsax lesion and he's called it the glenoid tract injury severity score so i i would urge all to go through it and you may find it really interesting and that looks like that probably we could treat instability far more accurately than we were kapil uh, sir one hypothetical question to you uh 20 year old guy uh, national uh, player of uh, boxing uh, had to first uh, bank card repair nicely done by senior colleague failed uh, now so he is uh, close to his uh, Uh, tournament uh, how are you going to uh, ma- manage this is it uh, how do you uh, advise about the surgeries let us say again bank ban- card repair uh, just uh, you i think the first thing you have to do is to find why it has why has it failed you know was there and i you know i've got an algorithm for failed instability surgery you need to go back to the initial episode how many dislocations before that was there unrecognized bone loss review the imaging from pre op you know did you did you have insignificant bone loss but it was bipolar so that may have, that was significant bone loss did you uh, at the time of surgery was uh, was the surgery done adequately did you have a good shift where were your anchors has any of the anchors failed uh, what was your technique and if at the end of the day you uh, you can identify a cause address that but in somebody who is a high level uh, collision sport athlete was failed instability procedure i think you are going to be erring towards uh, a bony procedure like a lateral j now i know that if there is no bone loss there is a higher risk of failure of a lateral j procedure but i still think that probably a lateral j would be the answer for this man but i would put him through the whole investigation i will repeat his uh, get a new ct scan if i had to do one investigation i'll do a ct scan to look for any bone loss and you know abhi alluded to postage stamp uh, lesions i've had two i have used knotless anchors for all my life uh, for my instability and i've had two where they've had a postage stamp lesion uh, is there an unrecognized small uh, fracture that you haven't seen so that's what how i would investigate and approach this patient okay then let's uh, i what i uh, got it here it's lethargy is your uh, if everything goes fine looking at this carrier lethargy will be your first choice Okay, fine. Uh, Vidhi, now we can. Rajiv, should we summarize uh, it for yeah, all our questions? Maybe last question, if I may allow to be asked. Uh, uh, in the initial slides, Doctor Abhik uh, showed that the examination and uh, radiology, uh, the uh, because it is a presentation and we are showing the young arthroscope. Is is there any value of doing uh, any examination of throat shoulder instability patient in the opd at today's day because i have stopped doing that only mri and ct scan is the probably deciding factor or it it is just hypothetical i think uh, i think if i can a big gone yeah uh, i would definitely yes we, w- w- why just instability w- w- what are we looking at we are looking at not just instability the most important thing am i missing something else does this person have a cuff tear does this person have something else does he have an ac joint problem does he have a c spine problem I mean <laughs> we are looking at the larger picture here have we examined is i had i operated on a patient with hyridinitis he had a big and he ended up with a big abscess there i never bothered to examine his axilla 
so yes not just uh, the instability examination we need to examine the patient completely strip him and see everything uh, dr kapil you were saying something no no i was going to say exactly the same thing i think your clinical examination is hugely important what are you dealing with here are you dealing with somebody who has got pure traumatic unidirectional instability does this patient have an underlying some element of ligament as laxity on which you have got the trauma uh, superimposed is that the cause of your failure is this a unilateral or bilateral problem and you know you may be right that apprehension sign may or may not be but at what level does does this patient get an apprehension sign do they have signs of an inferior capsular laxity uh, in terms of a gagey sign positive uh, how is that going to affect your management um, so you're right abik i think clinical examination is hugely hugely important uh, and pure reliance on an investigation is probably a little bit dangerous um, and maybe not the best message to to transfer on to but again also echo raman statement about latage Uh, Vishwadeep, in your summary, the latage procedure is not a procedure that has to be taken very lightly. It is, if you look at the literature, the complication rate is high. You know, whatever Jill Walsh does, we cannot. We are mere mortals. Jill Walsh is Jill Walsh himself, and Jill Walsh has done so many latage in his life, and he has now got to one percent complication rate. But the complication rate for an average orthopedic surgeon who does maybe five latages a year is very high, and we have to be uh, we have to be mindful uh, of that. Doctor Kapil, I am sorry, I'll interrupt you. and i think uh, in your concluding statement you did say something hugely about latage surgeon experience activity level demand of the patients and of course uh, uh, instability severity score so i think uh, let's go on to our next speaker uh, we have already uh, taken some time uh, i invite uh, dr pandey uh, for his next talk okay so right so can can you see my screen <clears throat> yes we can we can see okay so i i'm going to talk about irreparable rotator cuff tears i'm pandey and uh, from lester in uk so firstly we need to know what is a irreparable cuff tear so it's different to massive cuff tear uh here no repair is possible and almost 30% of your full thickness cuff tears can be classified as irreparable due to the massive tear size retraction and muscle atrophy it can be a very disabling problem especially in the young and it can cause pseudo paralysis so before you start the treatment you must get an x ray just because it's a cuff tear doesn't mean you don't do an x ray because whether the patient has arthritis or not will decide how you treat this patient and if you are planning any intervention a good mri scan is crucial so before we go on to some case based discussions um i i got my wires a bit crossed i don't have many cases but there are a lot of cases for each treatment this concept needs to be understood very clearly if you are dealing with irreparable cuff tears the humeral head escape so when there is no rotator cuff every time the deltoid deltoid contracts the humeral head goes up escapes hits the acromion and only then it abducts so this escape is extremely important and all the strategies which are there to treat ir- irreparable cuff tear are designed to push this head down centered in the glenoid so you want to prevent this humeral head escape all your strategies are essentially designed for that to so push it down and keep it in the del- in the glenoid so the deltoid can abduct it so that concept needs to be kept in mind so i would like you to see this picture so this is a 70 year old lady who's got pseudo paralysis on her right side facing and she is in a lot of pain and she's ha- uh, she's got virtually no cuff on mri scan so i mean i can ask what are you going to do but that'll take a lot of time so i just want you to keep in this lady in mind and then we'll discuss various options available she's got very little movement a lot of pain and she's unable to do her activities of daily living and the mri scan shows a massive cuff tear or irreparable cuff tear so 
this is the slide I wanted to show you, and I wanted to put all the options on one slide. That's why it's a slightly busy slide. So what are the treatment options? So you can start with targeted rehab down to reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And I'm not going to steal Raman's thunder because he's going to talk about reverse shoulder later on. So these are all the things available. So let's see what is what can be put for this lady. Targeted rehab. I, I kid you not, this is an extremely important strategy to have under your belt. Just because a patient has got a massive tear which is irreparable, that doesn't mean that you can't use physiotherapy. It is not just any physiotherapy. It has to be a well-designed physiotherapy specifically for irreparable rotator cuff tears. And the person who is going to do it is, has to be experienced. You should know how to do deltoid re-education, periscapular muscles re-education, how to uh, uh, use pec major trapezius ETC. So we use the program called the Torbay Hospital Regime by Answorth, and it has helped us a lot. We use it for at least three months. There are many such programs on the internet. You can ask your physiotherapist to read it and put that in practice. And I tell you, many of the massive irreparable cuff tears can do reasonably well with targeted physiotherapy, not just any physiotherapy. This is not for a recently qualified physiotherapy. There is a lot of, it's a proper regime which is to be uh, used. Now, this is a lady who is in a, 70s you can see the amount of movement she's got previously she was she could not lift her shoulder at all just with physiotherapy she's got nice functional range of movement people have done subacromial decompressions and debridement i think they're useless in a repairable cuff tear bocart introduced a partial repair sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but if you do nothing else to do you can try partial repair Tendon transfers, well, it's an attractive option, but it has got mobility and long rehabilitation period. And it is being done less and less, so many people are de-skilled. Latissimus dorsi is the most commonest one. All it does is provides external rotation and it depresses the humeral head. If you remember my Sometimes previous Sometimes it doesn't, slide, it but if you do nothing else to you can do a partial repair. Prevent the escape and tendon transfers. Well, it's an attractive Fact option, major but it has got mobility and long rehabilitation to, uh, because the results are variable. Um, so this is a lat dorsi transfer. You can use this lat smooth dorsi. You can extend it by putting either a hamstring or you can use allograph and you can attach it from outside on the posterior, posterior uh, superior aspect of the humeral head that depresses the humeral head. That is the most important and causes external rotation too. So if you have to learn one uh, muscle transfer, that's the one to learn. You can use the lower traps. These are all Basin slides, by the way. These are lower, tra lower trapezius. You can extend it and again, you can attach it from behind to the top of the shoulder and give you some, some range of movement. Essentially, it's depressing the humeral head so the deltoid can function reasonably well. I use a biceps tendon, which is quite flattened and thickened in this, and it can be used as a depressor of the humeral head. So this is a thick biceps tendon, which you would normally find. I do a biceps stenodesis, cut this here, put it back, and stitch it. And if you can repair the subscap at the front and the rest of the cuff from the back, that will be fantastic. You can even split the biceps and open it. If you don't have anything else, this is a good filler, which can be used. Uh, people have tried balloon arthroplasty. Initially, it gives good results, but then the results fade away. I, it's not getting uh, popular now, and people are moving away from balloon arthroplasty. So it is filled with saline, it's a balloon like that. You put it in the subacromial space and it inflates like that. But um, again, it's just trying to push the humeral head down so that the deltoid can work. Um, but it has not been so popular now. So now I come to what, I, what we do in Leicester. We use patches. So there is a large tear which cannot be repaired. 
So we fill it with patch. And the commonest patch we use is a graft jacket, which is an aloe graft, human skin. It acts as a biological scaffold. And it also, there is incorporation of the, with the native tissue. We have a slide to show that it does incorporate and it restores the post couple and provides a stable fulcrum. So this is a massive tear, uh, which is not being, which we cannot repair. So this is the graft jacket we use. This is a dermal uh, a graft. It comes in various thickness. So this side we attach it to the stump of the rotator cuff and this side to the greater tuberosity with anchors. We can use this for superior capsular reconstruction too when we put this, attach it to the glenoid instead of the cuff. And this is how it looks. You repair the front and then the back of whatever cuff is there. And they, they do reasonably well. And I'll be published uh, now with the third, fourth paper is already being published. Uh, we've done more than 300 cases with a reasonably successful outcome. Um, if you're just using a partial tear, repair, if you augment it with a graft jacket, uh, put, a put a patch in the gap, you get much better Oxford score, constant score. And if you remember this lady we saw, we did the um, graft jacket in her. And if you see, she's um, got very little movement, a lot of pain. And this is her a year after her operation with a graft jacket. Clearly, this is our best result. So that is why we are showing it to you. Not everybody gets results like this. So I don't want you to think that they, everybody will do that. But majority of them will do, will improve with range of movement and uh, the pain. And if you see, that is the lady we saw, the, the MRI, MRI scan shows a irreparable cuff tear. And this is the same person three years after graft jacket. Can you appreciate the tissue which is incorporated with the rest of the cuff? So there is a tissue, cuff-like tissue here, which is filled up this gap. Similarly here, there's an irreparable cuff tear. MRI scan after a year and a half shows cuff with the, the degenerate tendon. So there is a tissue which has survived and it incorporates with the native tissue. Then comes superior capsular reconstruction, which is being used extensively all around the world now for a irreparable cuff tear. And it's a reliable alternative for irreparable cuff tears. Here again, we are trying to push the head down into the glenoid. So there's a big tear. So we use the Mihata used fascia lata, which you anchor down to the glenoid here and to the greater tuberosity here. But now you can even use a graft jacket the same way as the fascia lata, reducing the donor site morbidity. So here also, it basically improves the glenohumeral kinematics so the deltoid can function better. Uh, so you're trying to depress the humeral head into the glenoid so that the deltoid can work well. But this is again an SCR. is a huge, large, massive, irreparable cuff tear. And this is a graft jacket which we have put uh, over the glenoid and over the uh, tuberosity. Unfortunately, I've been trying to play this video and it's not playing. It doesn't matter. Uh, you get the picture. So what to expect if you have an irreparable cuff tear? I think you can make the patient better, not normal. And you need to tell the patient that, that you you will not be normal, but you'll be a lot better than what you have right now. Right now, you have a lot of pain. You have pseudo paralysis, very little movement. I'll give you functional range of movement and pain will be much better. Their, their power remains weak, but they are better than before. So what do we do for irreparable cuff tears in, in Leicester? We do rehab. We use a, a program which is well designed for irreparable cuff tears. And I would request all of you to look at the internet. There are a lot of regimes which you can use. 
they should be tried for at least three months and a lot of patients will get better. And if they are not getting better, then we prefer graft jacket, which is a, a patch, which we cover the defect and then do rehab. So your rehab is still important even when you put patch. In some cases, we've also done superior capsular reconstruction, which we find is quite a, a good option. It's just that um, it's fixed at two points uh, over the glenoid and over the great tuberosity. So I think the tension will be amazing. And after two to three years, both graft jacket and SCR have up to 40% retears. But these retears are small. And by that time, your patient has rehabbed and they continue to have better results than what they had before. So our what we do is, uh, the lady was we first saw, uh, we will do a rehab for her. If that fails, we'll do a graft jacket. And you can also do a SCR. Uh, yes, some people are doing reverse shoulder arthroplasties for pure irreparable cuff tears in the elderly. That is fine, but I'm not going into it because I'm sure Raman is going to talk about it. Thank you. Vishwajit. Thank you, sir. Uh, just I have a few questions with me. Uh, uh, Dr. Pandey, sir, uh, yes. how you define uh, your uh, pseudo paralysis? Uh, at what time you uh, say this is pseudo paralysis? How, and uh, how you uh, manage them? Uh, do you advise them of physiotherapy before putting surgery or you go straight forward uh, for uh, OT? So, uh, pseudo paralysis is basically a misnomer, but essentially, the patient has no movement. They hitch their shoulder up like this. Can I, can you see me? I don't know. Ah, there we go. Right. So they hitch their shoulder up like this and they have very little movement in their shoulder. So that is what I would say, Surabha, but it's a misnomer as such. I will never, because you know that they don't have any rotator cuff and there is no easy surgical solution, uh, except if they are 85 year old and you can do a reverse shoulder. Everything else is is a compromise. So I will always, always, always put them through a rehab regime. Put them through physiotherapy, not any physiotherapy. That's the problem. People say, oh, physiotherapy, you send them to somebody who just makes them do a few exercises and does cuff strengthening. There is no cuff. What are you strengthening? So it has to be a regime which is well designed and it's a step ladder regime and exercises are introduced, subtracted. So it's a very, very highly specialized physiotherapy. And there are many regimes which are published on internet. You can use any. Most of them are good. I use the Tobe, and I'm sure Kapil uses his, has got a regime with, him, with, the, with his department. We use that. And a lot of them will be very, very successful. And if you are not successful, then you go for the next surgical uh, option. Okay. So physiotherapy always in my books. Uh, sir, rightly said, we have here in India, again, uh, only three exercise uh, patients uh, do always wall sliding, wheel, uh, wheel, wheel based exercise. That's all. This is what uh, all shoulder physiotherapists advise their patients. So uh, this patient has to, the physiotherapy has to understand that this patient has no cuff. So you, 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 you can't exercise his cuff. You have to use muscles like sure. major, trapezius latissimus dorsi, and if subscap is there, great. And these things have to be retrained along with the anterior deltoid to do the function of the rotator cuff. Essentially, you want to keep the humeral head down into the glenoid for the deltoid. Uh, sir, there is a question in the chat box. Kapil, sir, uh, do uh, you advise CT scan in first time dislocator for uh, glenoid bone loss assessment? Simple answer is yes. Okay. In all, uh, on all cases, yeah. But, yeah. If uh, no, no. Let me just clarify. It. Not for every first time dislocator, but if I am going to be, if I'm contemplating surgery, then I will do a, a CT scan definitely. Uh, don't you think so? MR three three uh, Tesla. If it is not uh, dislocating in mid range, uh, don't you think it is sufficient? Or you always always advise 
whosoever comes to you uh, ct scan i think that ct scan gives you a better uh, it's a better investigation modality to quantify your bone loss so we'll do a ct scan with 3d reconstructions to identify the bone loss okay uh, now my question to all faculty do or uh, our faculty have experience of lead dorsal transfer do they advise their patients sir um, first start with the uh, agrawal sir ramakant agrawal sir i think uh, you are mute raman raman you are mute uh, abhik sir you can answer this yeah, yeah. Later so on. this is uh, in my practice the number of patients who actually require tendon transfers are very very less so never got a chance to actually perform them and maybe one or two patients a year uh, because mostly they are old females who are who present with uh, rotator cuff tears secondly i have never been enthused by in a in a case of pseudo paralysis if the patient doesn't have pseudo paralysis i'll go and uh, go and repair the cuff but in a case of pseudo paralysis i don't think an tendon transfer is warranted uh, this is, has been the experience of philippe valenti this has been experience of yon tenny who's the more than 300 that is was dorsi and uh, and definitely that of the phones i asked him directly what does it do he said i don't know and i was in his operation theater when he did the all orthoscopic latissimus dorsi transfer that of the phones he said all i know it depresses as dr pandey said it depresses the humeral head whether it elevates the arm i don't know so the jury is still out i think uh, i don't have much experience but i i tend to do it for the younger patients and i learned it properly how to do it if and when i could uh, dr deepak joshi sir are you there yeah rajiv me too i think uh, we don't have that much of experience in tendon transfers at our institute uh, i really don't know but definitely we do will in a younger age dr raman said that in a younger patient we do intend to use that thing uh, whenever the situation we come across but i am looking forward to this it band uh, superior capsule reconstruction i think this is the option mala i have seen so many people now doing here in india too so this is the option that is available in an era variable rotator cuff as far as the graft jacket is concerned i think uh, we do have porcine grafts available with us but we don't have the human allograft i don't know we i would like to ask dr uh, pande what what type of uh, graft he is using for making this 8 mm graft jacket graft it's in porcine or bovine or he is using a human yeah, it's it's human uh, yeah dermal it's an allograft it's allograft. a human it's a human allograft so i so i saw so many people in us doing this thing i had i had visited dr barkard and he showed very good results of this thing but i think unfortunately this is not available with us and uh, once it is available i look forward to doing this thing probably uh, just just a straight forward answer question uh, would you li uh, like to have a tendon transfer in uh, coming days and future if you get the chance to learn and do start doing that yeah definitely <laughs> okay fine and uh, now my question to pande sir uh, how do you find difference between graft jacket versus scr in your practice which is better and uh, what you uh, uh, advise our audience uh, so scr is because scr is might be less costly as compared to graft jacket and uh, result wise you just share your uh, experience so we haven't done a direct comparison of the two so i can tell you my anecdotal uh, opinion i think both have perform as well but i don't have a randomized control trial one against the other the problem in india is we don't have graft jacket at the moment porcine graft porcine patches are available i think they are not bad they can you can use them so if you will use the scr uh, you you have to use a lattice uh, sorry the tensor fascia lata and i don't know if you if you see the scr it, it is an all arthroscopic procedure whereas graft jacket you can do an open procedure also you can do an scr uh, open but it will be a lot more difficult so arthroscopically so you need to have 
very high quality arthroscopic skills to do an all arthroscopic SCR. It takes a good couple of hours, two to three hours sometimes when you start doing it because you have to prepare the neck of the glenoid and put your anchors at the top there, which many of us have not been used to yet. So in my hands, I will do a graft jacket all the time, but there are people who do SCR most of the times. So I think uh, in the future, maybe 10 years from now, you will find both are, if they are both available, then will people will choose. At the moment, I can't say one is better than the other. Okay. Uh, Vishwadeep, you want to ask uh, anything? Yes, there's a, uh, there's a question from Dr. Kapil. Uh, Dr. Kapil, you've raised your hand. What would you like to ask? No, no, I, will, I was just going to make a comment on the SCR issue. And uh, I think in my opinion, I think the graft jacket augmentation, which the Lester group do is probably a more anatomical procedure rather than an SCR. SCR is a non-anatomical procedure. And with my experience of having done uh, SCRs over the last three, three or four years, I think the results are unpredictable at the very best. And speaking to other people around the UK as well, if you really are doing SCR for appropriate irreparable rotator cuff uh, tears, the results are very variable. It's, it is less predictable and it is le least predictable predictable in recuff retail. So again, that is something. And I don't know about the Rajiv, you mentioned about the expense. I would think it will be a very expensive procedure because you are using two anchors on the glenoid side and you're using at least four anchors on the humeral side along with the cost of a patch or in, or if you're using the uh, the elliptable band, that's a different issue. But the, the word of caution that SCR results are unpredictable. Can I say uh, something, Rajiv? Dr. Ramakan. See, as Kapil mentioned, there is hardly a difference of 40 to 50,000 rupees between an SCR and a reverse. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but Raman, what and, would you do in a 55-year-old? Oh, yes. I mean, that's a, that's a different thing. Yes. Um, but what I'm saying is, uh, it is very rare for a patient to reach Hamada 3 at 55. I mean, a patient can. But yes, I take your point. And Kapil has some experience with, uh, like your experience with the porcelain patches, Kapil. Had, and I don't think porcelain patches are any more available in India. I think Arthrex is not providing them because of, I think, they've got a very high infection rate. And I was doing... When I, Sorry, Raman. Just, to, just, uh, the, just about the porcelain patches, the, the issue with the SCR, and if you look at original Mihata's work, the elliptical band thickness was about eight millimeters. None of the porcelain patches is eight millimeters thick. They are much thinner than that. Much thinner. So thin if more. you, so if you are, so for example, we have used the the uh, DX patch from Arthrex, which is a porcelain patch, and you have to double it to get that thickness. And again, uh, you know, there is no randomized controlled trial between different types of patches. And I think a head-to-head -head comparison between the graph jacket augmentation versus an SCR will be the way forward. And I've just completed a national survey of best members on the use of SCR, and the figures are very interesting. Hopefully, we'll publish them later in the year. But so, at, at SCR, we have it is it is it is a very fashionable, sexy operation at the moment. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it, there is it, it there is a lot of uncertainty about the the outcome of that operation. I agree. I agree. Uh, Doctor Abhik, you want to make any comment? <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is my personal experience regarding SCR. Came with much fanfare, did three of them, all three failed. And uh, <clears throat> so I burned my fingers and my this is my prediction. I'm pretty good at predicting things. I predicted the stock market crash also. <laughs> uh, this is going to go away. Nihata is just... Did you predict the cricket scores? Huh? Did you predict the cricket outcome? No, you know, don't, 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 <laughs> kind of don't judge me. Any Australian on the panel? <laughs> it was... Uh, uh, one last question to Dr. Pandey. Uh, you mentioned in your slide thickness, variable thickness, how you decide your thickness for the graph jackets and SCR. So you and go then, for the thickest possible. Okay. The thicker Point. the better. Uh, uh, now so we there, are on... two, three, there are three, two, three thicknesses available. Uh, so if you are putting as an augment patch, if you repair the cuff and you want to put a patch, then you can use a thick, uh, sorry, a thin uh, uh, thin um, dermal graph, but if you are 
if you that is your only tissue you're going to put in like for an scia or a or a, a, a irreparable cuff tear use the thickest one up to 8 mm uh, if you can get it that will be the best way for pandey i have one question to ask you huh. is that if you have one reason to say why your patch dermal graft is better than uh, others what what why, why is it that it is more acceptable and you've seen your mris that the tissue is accepting and allograft as well so what is your one reason scientifically speaking that you know it is well aligned to your rotator cuff it healed to your rotator cuff it healed to the bone you see you got two points of healing and it gave you a result so scientifically speaking wherein uh, of course uh, the porcelain had failed and it had failed because it was uh, uh, it was a, it was a different species but why do you think uh, uh, this your successful outcome with you and dr modi is that why is it uh, that your 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 results are better so there are a couple of things i would like to say uh, i showed you the video uh, and i said to you that is my best case i agree so so not everybody is going to be like that but we do improve the pain and function so you are right what what you said is it's more anatomical so it's attached to the rotator cuff so the pull is in the direction of the rotator cuff it also depresses the humeral head that's why you have to use thick graft and it does integrate there is some cell migration between the edges of the cuff which grow into the dermal graft because it's a human dermal graft it's more likely to have cell migration rather than a if it's a pig skin or anybody else's skin yeah so i i mean i can't give you a 100% uh, scientific answer because but we have taken done slides we have looked at mri scan some of them do uh, tear but even if they tear previously they had a massive defect but now they have a smaller defect and while the head is down if you rehab them the deltoid is acting better i think so, your rehab also really really did help you and i think the pre op and post op rehab if it is same a patient is equipped to you know doing the same rehab and rehab does make a lot of difference in taking care of your repair as well so uh, from here on we'll go on to our next speaker uh, dr pathak uh, is he ready with his talk yeah yeah we can see you dr patak yeah okay uh, just a okay uh, so good evening everyone first of all i would like to thank jskc team rajiv vishwadeep for inviting me for this talk and uh, i was uh, fortunate to be part of jskc in 2018 and i think uh, 19 and 20 got cancelled but we are lucky that we are having it at least this online webinar uh, now so i think in continuation with what we are discussing about irreparable cuff the case scenario which was given to me was a large massive cuff so i'm going to show you a case which is going to have a, be going to be a good option for arthroscopic surgeons because uh, i think as we discussed uh, for large massive tears sometimes latissimus dorsi becomes technically difficult for arthroscopic shoulder surgeon and you need a special skill set to do that so this is a large rotator cuff tear treated with arthroscopic partial cuff repair and uh, with augmentation with low trapezius transfer using semi tendinosus as an extension so this is 60 year old gentleman who had uh, left shoulder pain since last 6 months weak abduction actually he had a fall 5 years back which was treated conservatively probably he had torn his cuff 5 years back there was again a reinjury 6 months back and then shoulder decompensated symptoms worsened he is physiologically young he is involved in amateur sport cycling gymming and he wants to do bit of it even post treatment this is the clinical examination if you see this is a classical pseudo paralytic patient where passive movements are full but active uh, a forward flexion is less than 90 degrees empty can drop arm belly press all were positive 
resi resisted external rotation was weak but external rotation lag was negative indicating teres minor was still functional this was x ray nothing significant these are the sagittal cuts and you can see uh, there is a significant muscle atrophy almost i would say it's grade 4 gutalier occupancy ratio you can see supraspinate is completely filled by fat uh, all around the supraspinatus belly subscap was uh, grade 1 to 2 fatty infiltration and you can see infra and teres minor are reasonably good and bulky this is a transverse cut of mri and you can see there is a retracted subscap tear up to mid humeral head level with posterior subluxation probably because of large posterior superior tear as well and this is coronal cut you can see a large retracted supraspinatus tear almost grade 3 pattern classification at glenoidal glenohumeral level so mri wise and clinically he had supraspinatus infraspinatus and probably superior half of subscap torn teres minor functional now uh, i like to classify them using p collins classification i think this is a very good classification to decide your uh, dr parthak just got disconnected and if you see yeah can you hear me and uh, now we can hear you uh, but Hello? we can't see you now yes yeah now okay now it's okay am i visible now you're visible and yeah. we have your screen also there yeah so now we have this five yeah. subtypes a b c d yeah. and if you see uh, where uh, our classification for this fits in is probably c where you have superior subscap tear supra and infra so it is antero supero posterior tears i would uh, classify them and if you see the options available so we have scr because he's 60 but physiologically young i think scr still is an option but again as we discuss cost is the problem and again mixed results and personal preference so i'm not very keen fond of scr procedure uh, i think uh, latissimus dorsi transfer again you need a certain skill set and as number of this uh, uh, rotator cuff irreparable or large tears are so less that to develop that skill set uh, is uh, i find it little difficult and you have to be really good at the Uh, your anatomy and uh, mus muscle now ped pedicle everything knowledge how to avoid damage to it but yes it can be a good option then third i think low trapezius transfer as a shoulder surgeon uh, because i'm doing um, significant number of scapular fixation so i am pretty confident about trapezius dissection so i think this is a easier option for us to think as an option for irreparable cuff tears and of course reverse shoulder but i think this patient profile was not right for reverse because he was relatively young no arthritis and he wanted to participate in uh, some sort of sports so i decided to do arthroscopic evaluation partial cuff repair and augmentation with low trap transfer so i usually do all my cuff repairs in lateral position this is good position even to harvest the low trap transfer so lateral position i have done certain markings to find out where the lower trap actually inserts so you have to uh, take uh, you can take either a transverse or vertical incision i think vertical incision is better now what i feel after doing couple of cases so vertical incision along the medial border of scapula and as we all know lower trap uh, is uh tendon length wise it is shorter and you need to reach at least to the infraspinatus footprint so you need some sort of extension so the extension graft described by bassam is uh, allo graft in form of tendo achilles but being a knee surgeon as well i was more comfortable with semi tendinosus so i decided to use a semi tendinosus and that technique has been also uh, well very well described in the literature uh, so this is a diagnostic round you can see bicep what degenerated you can see this large massive cuff tear 
with sort of a bucket handle in the supraspinatus uh, tendon area and it's all retracted till glenoid level uh, whole head is bare and if you go backward you can see uh, teres minor and maybe uh, uh, some part of infras infraspinatus is still holding on to the humeral head anteriorly yes subscap is definitely retracted and uh, but still i felt it was repairable i had to do lot of mobilization now i'm viewing from the subacromial uh, space this is the uh, infraspinatus tendon uh, it's very important to do a adequate mobilization so uh, on subacromial side and again on the i did a capsulotomy to mobilize the uh, infraspinatus tendon whichever was available for repair so i'm creating a plane between uh, glenoid and the cuff by doing a capsulotomy and this is the anterior side can see the superior part of subscap is completely retracted so i had to do uh, again release on either side of subscap and i had to mobilize almost till base of the coracoid to get uh, uh, some good chunk of subscap tendon because unless you have good subscap your low trap or latissimus dorsi is not going to work biomechanically you can see uh, it is atrophied but still uh, i could pull it out from fossa and uh, eventually i could repair it back and could balance the rotator cuff couple okay that's anterior to the subscap so these are certain images intraoperative so uh, in the left lower corner you can see the anchor for subscap is being put again this is arthroscopic picture multiple sutures taken through subscap and that's the final repair of subscap i won't say it is one of the best subscap repairs but still i could uh, restore the anterior sling for the glenohumeral joint the next step was to uh, harvest the lower trapezius uh, tendon uh, i think uh, this needs little bit of practice but uh, i was uh, able to uh, dissect it well and uh, put a couple of cracko stitches and uh, mobilize the lower trap tendon and then second step was to take uh, hamstring uh, graph semi tendinosus a 30 cm long graph can be double folded and can be utilized then i created a, a standard uh, cuff repair of posterior uh, uh, leaflet of infraspinatus was done using a triple loaded anchor single row repair and two more anchors were put anterior to that and you can see i have created a interval which goes from uh, lower trap sub deltoid and it can exit to the lateral portal then uh, first i fix semity to the footprint at infraspinatus using a triple loaded anchor so a double folded supraspine uh, hamstring tendon was repaired to the infraspinatus and the free ends were uh, you know shuttled back to the uh, infra lower trap and it was repaired back and uh, side to side uh, suturing was done and you can see these are couple of uh, intraoperative pictures that's the in posterior anchor that's the anterior anchor covering majority of the inferior uh, infraspinatus footprint and now you can see almost uh, posterior superior part of the footprint i was able to repair back with help of uh, partial repair and semitin uh, semity and this is the clinical video at 6 months patient is doing about 120 degree of flexion 90 degree of abduction and a very good uh, excellent rotation with good strength i think this option is going to uh, gain popularity because uh, uh, since 2016 basim has shown lot of uh, uh, papers with good results outcomes and i think it is technically easier to do this surgery in my view as compared to latissimus dorsi transfer so he has shown 33 patient average is 53 four year post op results and uh, flexion abduction external rotation is acceptable and significant improvement pain and in functional outcome and this is the systematic review for lower trap transfer and they have studied biomechanical uh, comparison with latissimus dorsi and clinical outcome and what they have concluded is they have uh, observed a large moment Um, uh, uh, in abduction and external rotation in adduction for lower trap transfer, um, and they were 
better than latissimus dorsi transfer so i think this can be one good option for patients with large massive posterior superior tears where you have very limited options so look i look at this uh, surgery for str and Uh, dr patak you are uh, we are having some disturbance uh. okay so that can you hear me now it's that my last slide only yeah now we can hear you yeah, yeah so i think that was my last slide so thank you very much for patient uh, listening uh, very interesting um, uh, i think uh, we can unshare the screen yes so few questions uh, to you dr patak uh, yeah. i think uh, your uh, surgical skills are brilliant uh, you 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 were able to uh, do it whole arthroscopically uh, but uh, the uh, vis a vis had had you not had a uh, tendon transfer in your mind say mm-hmm. i'm just giving a hypothetical what other thing you would have done for this gentleman at 60 years who looked like physiologically 55 his demands are high he doesn't want a joint replacement and do you think he would have done the same way with a kind of a partial repair and probably uh, something else but uh, not what you've done or uh, do you think the procedure which you done my uh, what i'm coming to is in the next question my my first question is uh, Uh, did you have any other procedure in your mind when you did that no so the first uh, uh, you know option was to do a partial repair only okay. so i had counsel patient that uh, i may do augmentation with low trap transfer but after doing a diagnostic round i realized the infraspinatus was quite flimsy and probably i can do a better robust uh, repair with some additional augmentation by low trap and i think i went through literature extensively basam then uh, uh, george atwal they have done lot of studies with good uh, follow up more than 2 3 years so i thought this is a good procedure and as i said uh, if if you ask me to do a lat dorsi transfer i'm not skilled to do that i have to take help of a plastic uh, surgeon my colleague and here you know uh, there is no need i, I can very well you know work around scapula and there are no major neurovascular structures nearby so i think this is a good procedure uh, for arthroscopic shoulder surgeon where you can do little bit you know mini open exposures and get away so can you tell a little about how you would put your semi t exactly on the gt how uh, uh, because the the breadth of uh, the semi t uh, together when you put it uh, on to the humeral side uh what is your technique to put it there with the screws are you able to hear me your screen is frozen i can hear you can you hear me yeah now we can hear you hello yeah yeah so see you want to give a coverage about a centimeter and a half right that would cover most of infraspinatus footprint so now exactly what we do a uh, sort of a double row repair where you cover bigger footprint i used two da- triple loaded anchors so one is to fix the looped end of the infra uh, semi t okay? okay and once you have fixed it the the tra- trailing part of uh, uh, this can be transfixed with the anchor which is put behind the first one which is more posterior so that you know sort of a strip of double folded semi t can be well fixed to infra spinal so i i found it was easier to control a free graft which is a tubular than which is a flattened one so do you think your graft still works like a depressor or uh, in your mind do you think the excursion of the segment of the graft is too huge which may uh, hamper the healing between because the healing now the healing zones are on the gt from the trap to the semi t and of course the trap has been lifted off and now you have added a long tendon excursion to it in your mind uh, when you think about now this tendon functioning do you think it still functions like dr pande said like an head depressor 
or functionally do you think it goes around the gt and acts like an isp um, uh, no, see, you know, see. Cuff. i agree we we have to understand one thing all tendon transfers around shoulder especially for posterior superior cuff tear they act on same principle depressor effect but only advantage with low trap is if you see the pull of the trapezius is exactly like infraspinatus latissimus dorsi is internal rotator but a uh, lower trap exactly gives you external rotation pull so i think the direction alignment trajectory of pull of trapezius is exactly like infra so that is additional so you don't need retraining of lower trap it is naturally its function is to do, give external rotation i think that's a very relevant point and basab has published uh, it in a, when he describes the vectors in the pull especially the pull of the trap he is compared it to the pull of the isp uh, is any other speaker has experience on the particular procedure uh, which dr patak has described okay uh, can i say a couple of things vishwadeep uh, i don't have a personal experience but i have uh, had the chance to go into little bit of depth of this procedure and i have i have i have heard bas i have interacted with uh, uh regarding the procedure now a uh, great thing shirish first of all my congratulations to you and i agree with you that in our practice uh more we see more of supra and infraspinatus tears not of teres minor if we have only infraspinatus tear and supraspinatus tear lower trapezius trap is the perfect answer in the indicated patient number 1 number 2 if you want a depressor function basically you want a depressor function and not a rotation so you want a rotation as well as depressor function i am talking of pseudo paralysis now so you will bring the graft anterior onto the humeral head onto the gt footprint so that you could achieve the depressor function but the real indication for lower trap would come when in the er1 basically external rotation in a deduction purely an infraspinatus function but if you teres minor is also gone and the patient is pseudo paralytic or pseudo paresis not pseudo paralytic then you can have a latissimus dorsi transfer because it will provide a better elevation as compared to uh, rotation philippe valenti who has modified the technique of helbus by doing a, a, a semi t uh, hamstring tendon uh, because allografts are not available there and it's very expensive so he has used the semi tendinosus tendon as shirish has shown and philippe valenti says no indication of tendon transfers in pseudo paralysis now the question is i got great regard for basam but i have one question if you read basam's paper basam says his results were best if the patient had pre operative flexion of more than 60 degrees now if the patient has pre operative flexion of more than 60 degrees and not 90 pseudo paralysis but then pseudo paralysis has not been defined properly as yet and now the recommendations are coming that if the patient is not able to lift more than 45 degrees that is pseudo paralysis 60 degrees perhaps will not count as a pseudo paralysis and will count as pseudo paresis two pseudo paralysis and antero superior escape both are different entities if the patient is actually having antero superior escape and as shirish pointed out no subscap failure patient cannot be unstable anteriorly if the patient is unstable anteriorly gone is everything reverse is the only answer there but if the patient is stable anteriorly good subscap good labrum everything good then perhaps in er1 lower trap and er2 that is must dorsi that's the answer yeah. i think uh, uh, dr raman has very well uh, put some light on especially pseudo paralysis pseudo paralytic and uh, uh, where it has been redefined and relooked and uh, uh, it is ideal but uh, yes uh, i think dr shirish uh, would like to finalize the discussion in in a matter of picking up ideal cases for latissimus dorsi picking up I- ideal cases for trap transfer uh not considering that he's done this procedure but what he thinks in his practice is ideal for a person who's just started to do these procedures and is not regular in it in terms of picking up the right patient uh the age of the patient the activity and what is the target of the surgery which is discussed between the shoulder and the uh, patient and shoulder surgeon and the patient dr shirish yeah so now see 
latissimus dorsi and lower trap technically they have got same indications now complication don't do latissimus and lower trap transfer for females they are primarily described for muscular male patients so someone who is physiologically less than 60 who has got posterior superior irreparable cuff tear with good subscap or at least repairable subscap with no arthritis is a good candidate for this tendon transfer but you have to counsel patient you don't expect that patient will have full range of movement they will gain good external rotation strength about 90 degree of abduction and maybe about 100 plus forward flexion and this result even uh, gerber has described will take at least one year to show so we don't expect result to come overnight so you have to retrain your tendon so that over next one year patient will have this sort of function so i think young irreparable posterior superior cuff tear in male is the right indication for lat dorsi or low trap transfer just one question quickly to shirish shirish did you put your patient into a shoulder spike no so uh, i used the external rotation brace which okay. we had uh, designed it well before and fitted to the patient before surgery because you need about 30 to 40 degree of external rotation and of course in zero adduction or neutral arm by side not in abduction so and I, that we maintained for 4 weeks and gradually got it to neutral in next 2 okay. weeks okay are you should we go to the other topic or do we have any chat uh, uh, can i say one thing about this yes dr pande so uh, closing statement the the uh, sirish what he's saying is absolutely right that the lower traps uh knees needs less reeducation because of the direction of the fibers they are more anatomical uh compared to lat dorsi so the uh, advantage of lat dorsi is you you have a lot of excursion you can you don't need to lengthen the tendon so much as yeah, you have yeah. to do in uh if you are not a knee surgeon uh, i have not removed a semi tendinosis for god knows how many years now it, it is not such an easy thing to do and i have amputated some uh, semi tendinosis i want that big and it becomes that small and then there is a problem so but but it's i don't think you need a plastic surgeon to how no, you absolutely that. don't need hair in india to take a semi t <laughs> yeah no, semi he's talking of ld LD plastic surgery <laughs> so if fact, i should... uh, i think our shoulder surgeons are better at uh, harvesting that and putting it around <laughs> and uh, ld can also be done arthros all arthroscopic yes it is a bit difficult than uh, the uh, lower trap but it is a uh, it is a doable uh, by an orthopedic surgeon So if I share, uh, allow to share my limited experience. I did when I was in Italy with Dr. Porcellini. They used to do ten uh, lat dorsi every month. So I was so encouraged that oh. when I came back to India, I started doing lat dorsi. And when first my two months, I did uh, first my one year, I did around four lat dorsi transfers. And unfortunately, it was very discouraging. All the four patients, they actually did not recover well. I took uh, help of the plastic surgeon to harvest the tendon, and you know, I reattached it on the turf. So I stopped doing last six years. I haven't done a single. So this is just my. That, that you... was your problem taking the plastic surgeon's help. <laughs> That's why you didn't. <laughs> you should have been alone. <laughs> Because they <laughs> don't use clocks. You see, they don't have clocks. They in their theaters. We our theaters. We have clocks. they have calendars so <laughs> uh sorry to interrupt you sir we have uh, young surgeons in our audience just my question to dr sirish if you get a massive tear uh, and uh, how you mobilize them how you repair them what is uh, the indication of partial repairs how you medialize how much you can medialize just uh, just brief and fast uh, yes <laughs> large tear that difficult to come on uh, difficult to bring on the footprint so i think uh, see i'm sure it is everybody's experience that uh, even if it appears to be a large retracted tear majority of the tears can be repaired well 
you have to make sure that your fatty infiltration is less than 50% and the duration from injury to your treatment is not more than 3 months roughly if it is subacute or acute presentation even a retracted tear can be very well mobilized so there are certain mobilization technique where you do capsulotomies you go into the subacromial space till the base of spinous process and release or adhesions you go anteriorly release coracohumeral ligament and go till base of the coracoid i am not a great fan of interval release but if you do this majority of tendons can be very well mobilized now second thing is after your best mobilization you try to reduce the torn cuff if you are able to get back or cover whole footprint then you can think of a anatomical footprint double row repair fixation if you find that you are able to reduce only 50% in such cases i would do a single um uh, a single um Raw repair, single repair, because you I want low tension repair. So, I think we lost you, uh, Rajiv. Let's go to the next topic. Yeah, next talk. So I invite uh, Dr. Kapil uh, to do his talk on subscap tear and biceps pathology. Uh, which i think he can throw some good light on uh, subscap and uh, uh, maybe uh, tell us about all the pathologies around the anterior aspect which includes the biceps as well uh, dr kapil thanks very much vishwadeep it's a pleasure to be here i wish we were in jaipur and not in a very cold and damp north of scotland but same here to make good ones so um I'll talk a little bit about subscap tears, and what I've done through this talk is that I'll talk to you about various types of subscap tears and how do I approach them and I fix them. But just before we go there, just a very quick slide about the anatomy because it's very very important, especially for the younger members uh, of the audience. Just to highlight the the insertion of the subscap and its close relationship to the biceps. So if you get an imaging done where you're Uh, radiologist tells you that the biceps is subluxed from its groove anteriorly please have a very high suspicion that you may have a subscap tear the other structure that i'm going to draw your attention to is the the coracohumeral ligament the coracohumeral ligament attaches on to just to the top end of the subscap in this area next to the bicipital groove but in a chronic retracted subscap tear as the subscap moves medially and retracts it takes away pulls medially with itself the coracohumeral ligament and this thick band is known as the comma sign and i'll show you in one of the uh, videos the the comma sign how to identify it and some hugely important structure uh, to identify when you're dealing with a subscap tear and it helps you to mobilize and identify the tear so <sighs> i know i'm not sure about others but as time has gone by and i've been doing more arthroscopies you start fixing more subscap tears and i think the reason is that they are more common than we actually think or identify and if you look at a, the literature it seems that one in three patients who need an arthroscopy for a cuff tear have got an underlying subscap tear and i'm sure that in the first few years of my career uh, doing arthroscopies i probably have missed a few subscap tears because i was not looking for them and i'm not going to you know we are all aware of the clinical tests uh, which is the bear hug test the belly press and the lift off and if you do all three your chances of picking up uh, a subscap tear improve and again that's the importance of clinical examination and not just reliance on uh, radiological investigations as a part of your work up before you start managing these patients i'll briefly talk to you about the classification and then because it determines how you manage these uh, operatively there are a number of classification systems that you can see in the literature but the most common one and which i use as well as the lafosse classification so type 1 and 2 involve the upper third 
which are between a partial or a complete tear. And the type three involves the upper two thirds, while in type four and type five, it's an extensive subscap tear. And in type fives, essentially there is, it's virtually an irreparable subscap tear and you're looking at salvage procedures to deal with this uh, type of a tear. And as I said, I, what I've done is I've tried to identify from my collection of tears of all types, and i just show you how I deal with them. Bearing in mind that not every tear will need surgery, and you, I'm presuming that you've been through with your patient uh, through a rehab process, non-operative management with uh, injections and physiotherapy. But probably that applies to the to the vast majority of degenerative tears. But in a traumatic tear, which may occur if you've had an injury that has put your patient's position into an uh, arm into a position of abduction or external rotation. And occasionally in the older patient, it may be associated with an anterior dislocation of the shoulder as well. And as Shirish just told us that in the traumatic tears, early interventions are very important, whichever part of the cuff you're dealing with. But as I said, the vast majority of degenerative tears, and you would give them a trial of non-operative treatment. So when, you're, when we do look at them arthroscopically, the biggest thing is identification and this challenge of visualization of the subscap footprint. So this image here is imaging is viewing with a standard 30 degree scope. On the other hand, if you view with a 70 degree scope, you can see the footprint here. But again, all of us may not have access to a 70 degree scope. So with a 30 degree scope, as you see in this video, you put the arm in flexion and internal rotation and you can identify a partial tear with exposure of the footprint of the subscap in this area here. So that's a good maneuver to use, put the patient's arm into a position of flexion and internal rotation. Now, I do all my arthroscopies in uh, the beach chair position and hence this slide here. So the portals that you will use are, of course, your standard posterior portal, your anterior rotator interval portal, a lateral portal. But this portal here, the anterolateral portal, which you can use for working as well as visualization, gives you a direct inline view of the subscap here and helps you to do a release, as well as um, put sutures and repair. So this is a hugely important portal while doing a subscap repair. So this is a, a partial thickness tear of the superior thirds. You can call it a type two tear. You can see the tear in this area with the footprint exposed. So once you have prepared the footprint, you put an anchor, this is an older video where I used to use knotted anchors for these. I moved over to using tape and uh, knotless anchors now. So you put your anchor in there. This is a double loaded anchor. You use a instrument like a penetrating grasper to go through the tendon medially and just pushing the, the suture a bit medial so that when you pass your instrument, the penetrating grasper here or a clever hook, you're able to pierce the tendon, grab the suture and pull it out. And you repeat it with the other suture and then you tie them. These are just simple sutures. You can use a mattress suture as well, but essentially once you've tied them, you have restored the, the footprint. Like so, but as I said, now I've moved on to using uh, knotless anchors for these. So when you're dealing with a big retracted subscap tear, as I said, they are very commonly associated with biceps pathology. So this is viewing from a standard posterior portal. There's a retracted tear of the subscap with a few fibers here, a lot of adhesions and a very degenerate biceps as well. So the first step here is to try and release and mobilize the, the subscap. And as Shirish showed in this video as well, you need to do a, uh, a release on all sides of the subscap to mobilize the subscap tendon. So this is onto the glenoid side. 
This is on the anterior aspect of the, the subscap. That's the stump of the bicep, which is retracted to, to the middle of the humeral head. You can see it's still quite scarred. So you carry on with the adhesions, uh, mobilizing the adhesions, and then this is the instrument coming through the anterolateral portal, which I talked to you about earlier. As you can see, it gives you a direct line of pull onto the subscap. So you carry on uh, with the soft tissue releases. The coracoid is just there. So you mobilize the, the subscap from the, the coracoid process, take away all the adhesions in the subcoracoid space and mobilize that space. Again, assessing the, the mobility and the, the extent of your releases. So now I'm visualizing through the anterolateral portal and working from the anterior portal to prepare the, the bed in the lesser tuberosity. So passing uh, tapes here, as I said, moved over to not less anchorage now. So using a scorpion device to pass fiber tapes. This is a nautilus swivel lock anchor. You can see that reduces the cuff nicely onto its footprint. And then you can go and uh, deal with, once you've done this, you can deal with the biceps, which in this case, I did a bicep stenotomy. And then you can go and deal with the, the posterior superior cuff tear. That's the superior cuff anchors inserted now. And then this is a knotted repair for the superior cuff. So now coming to the comma sign. Now this is again doing for the posterior portal. This is another patient who is about 60 years old. You can see the subluxed biceps tendon here. And you see this band of tissue coming from where the subscap would be and going proximally or, or superiorly. This is the comma tissue and it's different. You know, uh, just a little word. It's a, don't confuse this with the, the long end of the biceps tendon. The biceps is running from the glenoid into the arm laterally while this tissue is going, moving in a, is, is running from an inferior to superior direction. So this is the biceps, which is subluxed. And that is the comma tissue here. And comma tissue is hugely important because if you now put a traction suture in the, in the uh, coma tissue, and as you pull on it, you can see the subscap tendon coming into view. So very important to recognize and use that coma tissue as a mobilization uh, maneuver to pull your subscap. So just going on with the repair in this case, you've passed the You pass the, the traction suture in the comma tissue, and then you can use that to further mobilize the subscap tendon. You can see it's a tear involving more than two thirds of the, uh, the subscap uh, <coughs> insertion. And that's the adhesion superiorly, which you need to mobilize. And again, working anterior to the subscap tendon, just in the subcoracoid space here. Just going to fast forward this a little bit. So that's the, the, the coracoid process, exposing the base of the coracoid and releasing all adhesions between the coracoid and the subscap allows you to pull the subscap completely to its footprint. And you can see how mobile this now becomes and you can bring it to its footprint. We are not still not sure about the, the inferior part here, but you'll see the instrument coming here in a second. And then it's just a question of 
passing fiber tapes and two uh, knotless anchors, which I did in this case. So that secured the inferior part, and then you do the superior part, and you've sorry, and then. <coughs> You have restored the whole subscap footprint here, but as I said, you have got the the type force. So this is a lady who's got a strongly positive belly press test. Uh, you can see a little bit of anterior superior escape uh, in the shoulder, and this is an MRI scan with complete fat infiltration of the the subscap muscle belly. And when I scoped her, uh, this subscap was completely irreparable. So in this case, I used something which Pandey showed for his uh, superior cuff. So this is, uh, this is not graph jacket, this is the Arthroflex, which is another type of dermal allograph uh, marketed by Arthrex. So secured this to the muscle belly medially uh, into the subscap and then secured laterally with a double row um, sort of speed bridge kind of technique. So that I've just shown you the spectrum of all types of uh, subscap tears and how to deal with them. Then to come to the biceps, those are the only two options, to cut or not to cut. Um, if, the if the biceps is involved, uh, you can cut it and leave it. And I think the vast majority of your patients will be happy if you do a tenotomy. Uh, only uh, not everyone gets a Popeye sign because the Biceps can sometimes get entrapped in the in the pulley area. Uh, and there are some surgeons who will never do a tenodesis. But if you decide to do a tenodesis, the whole question is where will you do it? Do it subpectral or suprapectral? Uh, if, if you do an arthroscopic tenodesis, so uh, I tend to <coughs> tenodesis in the groove here. Uh, so essentially pass sort of uh, double uh, mattress sutures using a tape. Then from an uh, anterior anterolateral portal just next to, just uh, medial to the bicipital groove, free up the, the pulley, prepare the, the groove in this area here, roughen it up, and then use, I use a, a swivel lock anchor to so that's my uh, mattress, double mattress uh, fiber tapes. If I'm doing it along with a subscap repair, then the swivel lock anchors have got retaining sutures and I use them to tie the biceps into the group. So that's the completed biceps undesis using a purely knotless anchor technique where you don't have an accompanying cuff tear or a, a subscap tear. Very occasionally you are presented with something like this. This is a bodybuilder who's abused steroids and he's had a spontaneous rupture of the long end of the biceps on this side. And obviously for this man, cosmesis is a big thing. But he has also got pain in his biceps on doing it, attempting any lifting heavy objects. So this was an open sub-pec tenodesis using a, a pec button from Arthrex. So this is his tendon, which is probably the thickest biceps tendon I've ever seen. So done a whip stitch and use a unicortical pec button to secure it um, just, above, uh, just below the pec major. So in summary, I think subscap tears are more common than we think, and a lot of them may go unrecognized. Biceps pathology is associated with most of these, and you can get away with just doing a biceps anatomy. The arthroscopic repair and subscap, you need to do uh, be patient, do a lot of releases, respect the coma tissue, and if you've got an irreparable tear, you can try augmentation or tendon transfers, or you can consider reverse arthroscopy last year for all the patients. Thank you very much. I think uh, those were very nice uh, demonstration of all the types of uh, 
uh, as you said that the uh, your practice has changed over a certain time that in recent times you started to repair these stairs more am i right when i when i say so so in yeah, your sure they, i think you you're absolutely right and i think the reason i've repa started repairing these is that i have now started looking for them and finding them i think till about 5 years ago i was not looking for them my my question to you is that in in the you know you've been there in this practice for more than two decades so in in this part of the decade when you actually started to repair this how has your uh, you know results changed as uh, did uh, affect your pain pattern or stiffness pattern of uh, you know uh, vis a vis in the last time where you never used to repair them and now you since you repaired them did you come across few changes or your you know your results were better what what difference do you largely see not the published matter but in your personal opinion uh, opinion i think a number of looking with hindsight a number of patients who did not do as well many years ago after a, what i thought i had done a good rotator cuff repair was probably because of an unrecognized subscap tear which i had not fixed as far as stiffness is concerned i think i don't think there is any difference in my patients get being post operatively stiff although you could argue that some of these subscap repairs may get stiff especially if you over tighten them you know if you've got a type 1 or type 2 tear and you do a very tight repair there is a higher risk of you stiffening them up but i, I think the key is to go and look for it and i'm not going to say that you should fix all type 1 tears type 1 tears can be divided in left but a type 2 tear which is a complete tear of a superior third uh, subscap i think should be fixed and the biceps dealt with because a biceps tendon which is either subluxing or diseased and unless we go and look for it and if we leave it that is going to perpetuate the problem and cause a, a poor functioning a poor functional result so largely speaking your uh, it has been better for you in terms of your results and now since you started to see them so you're not missing any of them and your management uh, particularly in the rehab pattern has not changed so no my my rehab is very simple i i if i've done a good repair my rehab for all cuff tears is pretty aggressive i will start them uh, active assisted elevation to about 60 degrees external rotation to a neutral on day 1 unless it's a very very big tear most of them will spend only 4 weeks in a sling and start active range of movements at 4 weeks so particularly in the case which you showed which was almost a repairable subscap where you used a, a graft jacket uh, how 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 did you repair the jacket to the muscle itself usually it becomes difficult when you don't have a tendon to attach to a graft uh, uh, how, uh, any tips that was essentially um, it's mattress fiber wire sutures that is what i used to secure to the to the medial muscle belly i will be uh, it i will be dishonest if i say to you that that patient has done extremely well i can say to you that the patient i showed you with the big comma sign and the big subscap tear at 3 months he's got full function back yes but the lady with the augmentation because of lockdown she's never come back to see me which may be a good sign that she's got no problems yes but and we have tried to contact her a lot of times or it may be a bad sign that she doesn't want to the thing is our patients don't go anywhere else you know they will have to come back to us so she has not come back to see me but that big subscap tear with the big comma sign the whole subscap was gone at 3 months follow up i have discharged him from my care because he is doing extremely well yes so uh, those were uh, very nice points on the subscap and uh, management of the biceps pathology can i say yes. one thing just basically just one yes sir, yes, sir. so a uh, couple i mean this is really interesting i mean you went ahead and did that uh, graft jacket sort of thing on subscap and i firmly believe because subscap is not only about the uh, you providing the internal rotation strength or an elevation subscap comes from inferior to superior position uh, and for force couple but it is a very very important anterior stabilizer of the shoulder as well so if lapo says that if you find head is centered at subscap is gone still repair it because it will give you a tenodesis effect for the anterior instability and prevent anterior superior escape if not functioning as a muscle but it will function as a tendon as a tenodesis effect 
so that was nice kapil really nice uh, fixing this uh, goal so a uh, grade 3 grade 4 which is unusual but grade 3 up to grade 3 you can safely fix but grade 3 probably you'll have to go extra articular to do that and grade 1 and 2 probably intra articular uh, uh sir regarding rehabilitation my question to all faculty uh, related to cuff it's a supra uh, big uh, cuff uh, uh, starting with uh, dr deepak joshi uh, do you immobilize them how you rehabilitate them uh, do you slings any external rotation any preference for that yeah see if we, if we have it uh, Uh, we now have started mobilizing them quite early. We used to put them in a mobilizer for about six weeks, but they used to be stiff, and the results were not that good. So we are now mobilizing them. As Dr. Kapil was saying, we are mobilizing them quite early. So we allow put them in a sling, and we allow them to do little bit of activities that they like, brushing the teeth or something, some household activities they can do with a sling on. And uh, we tend to remove the sling at around four to five weeks. and we uh, lots of exercise lots of mobilization as um, we try to gain full movement about 6 to 8 weeks time is there any situation where you don't want aggressive rehabilitation as dr kapil yeah is that bad and if um, we think the repair is not not that good quality is not that good then we give the abduction pillow or we keep it in external rotation and uh, we tend to be slow in those cases but as such the prognosis uh, again becomes bad in the such cases so uh, only doctor shirish our repair if the anchor that i have put so many time the bones are so osteoporotic if the if the anchor that i have put is not that secure then we tend to mobilize them little bit slow uh doctor shirish my question to you if you get a cuff tear with the left shoulder how you manage this situation so if it is a <clears throat> cuff tear with stiffness to begin with i will if it is a, a surgical patient i would definitely go in repair and simultaneously i'll do capsular release if i'm confident about my repair then early mobilization so usually all of my patient they start some passive range of movement in form of pendular hangs neutral rotation and some supported flexion and abduction immediately but i don't do active mo- movement at least for first four weeks and uh, sorry to interrupt you if you don't find your uh, repair is uh, not so good then uh, chances of f- stiffness again if you uh, keep them immobilized no i, I don't do this thing they may become stiff for some time but eventually they get better okay so uh, four, four weeks of uh, immobilization won't give them too much of stiffness Uh, for audience benefit uh, do you advise them go ahead for surgery do a release rather than uh, emphasize on physiotherapy get the range and then repair it it's all uh, surgical skill uh, uh, depend upon surgical skill or it's a, it's a uh, message to all audience no i think if it is a stiff shoulder to begin with till patient comes up for surgery i would definitely put them on some prehab but i would not wait that let range of movement come back and then i will uh, repair him i would go ahead with surgery but i would utilize that whatever time i may be a week or so to give some prehab but immediate post op mobilization is very critical for such patients who are very okay. pre operative okay now comes to sub step do you use 70 degree scope no uh, dr kapil do you use 70 degree scope your sub step repair or 30 is enough no i use a i use a 30 degree scope uh, only i do all my procedures in beach chair position and i think you can identify most of the subscap tears by putting the arm in flexion and rotation and for large retracted tears an anterolateral viewing and working portal is really useful so i think for the audience benefits 30 degree scope is enough for subscap repair uh yep. uh any special dr sirish as you do in the lateral position any specific tip uh, uh doing the sub scap repair if you want to share anything apart yes. from beach chair yeah uh, s- certain modification i definitely do i make sure that i have good access to the anterior part of the shoulder so you can tilt patient little bit more posteriorly because you know that this may patient need sub scap repair and sometimes i adjust my traction pulley typically it is on front of the patient i take it back side of the patient so that you know the uh, vector goes little posterior and i have good access to the anterior part of the shoulder but i i think there is no big problem with lateral position you can easily do uh, subscap repair even in lateral position uh, 
Great. Uh, Dr. Vidi Vishwadeep, we can invite uh, next speaker. Yes. So I think uh, from here on, uh, we can now invite uh, our next speaker, Dr. Raman Kant Agarwal, and he will be speaking on reverse shoulder. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see you. Uh, we can see your screen. Uh, you can now start yeah. your slideshow. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, this is not really in relation to the cup tears. Both the cases I am going to show, but of course the uh, rotator cuff arthropathy has got the best results, and irreparable cup tears in elderly have got the best results, second best results in reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So my talk is more based on how to tackle the glenoid because uh, we get delayed cases and the glenoid version as well as the inclination both are compromised especially the inclination is more compromised um, in cases of cup tear arthropathy uh, so uh, and we don't have 3d planning software or very specific angle cutting guides patient specific guide wires augmented base plates have arrived in india but i don't have access to them uh, synthetic graphs definitely a big no no I make use of this uh, uh, Friedman's line, uh, which has been further uh, worked upon, and the glenoid line is also coming. But I still use the whole scapula. Uh, I make sure that my CT scans do have the medial tip of the scapula, and then I go ahead and draw the Friedman line and the version angles. Uh, glenoid version, as detailed. Uh, uh, Type A1, it, the, it, when you draw the line, it doesn't cut the humeral head, but type A2 actually cuts the humeral head. The glenoid line will cut the humeral head, and this type A2 can be very deceptive to find out between the type C and type A2. But uh, remember, in type A2, the joint space is gone, and in type C, the joint space is preserved. So that's the only thing we know about B1 and B2. So B3 has also been added by the Bursic now, uh, which again is difficult to differentiate from A2 sometimes. So acceptable version of the glenoid is plus 2 to minus 5 in total shoulder and plus 2 to minus 10 in reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So we should aim to implant our base plate in not more than 10 degrees of retroversion if possible. This is a slide which was, uh, this study came when we didn't have any central screw for the reverse base plate and all the designs were based on the PEG system, but still it holds true even for the screws because you need certain amount of bone stock in the glenoid wall to fix the screw and minimum is 15 to 16 millimeter. However, let's go back. So in this case, if I want to make it plain and achieve an 80% contact of the base plate, I will have to let go of this much whole bone, which will reduce the glenoid bone stock. Um, so this will further medialize the glenoid, decrease the vault bone stock, further shorten the remaining posterior cup. So eccentric reaming at all the times is not a very good option. But probably if you've got less than 10 or 15 degrees of uh, retroversion, you could deal with the uh, eccentric rimming. But anything beyond 15, you have to do the grafting of the glenoid. So I present to you this gentleman who is 67 years old and he had four years history of frozen shoulder as is rampant in India. He also had a good cuff on the x-ray and the true AP view showed osteoarthritis and the glenoid showed a static posterior subluxation of the humeral head. In fact, more than 80%, more than 90% of the humeral head was statically locked posteriorly. And it was a biconcave glenoid. So we did a CT scan, we found out that the glenoid bone stock was pretty good, 1.68 centimeters, so around 17 millimeter was the glenoid vault, the depth of the glenoid vault, and the Posterior glenoid bone loss was around 0.54 centimeters. So 54 millimeter was the glenoid bone loss. Now imagine if we do an eccentric reaming and I'm co-planing it, I will lose all the glenoid. And this is a very precious bone anteriorly. So there was a significant posterior glenoid wear and it needed a wedge graft, but we don't have an option uh, of achieving that because we don't have the bell, bell saws, cutting guides. 
So this is how, how we did it. We plan it on the humeral head. The superior cut goes oblique, posteriorly and inferiorly so that we could create a wedge and the inferior cut goes parallel to the anatomical neck. And you obtain the wedge graft. And you see this, this whole pinkish thing is the paleoglenoid and the whole white thing is the neoglenoid which is the retroverted glenoid. And it's very easy to fall into the trap of implanting the whole base plate on the retroverted glenoid, which was around more than 20 degrees of retroversion. So we took the graft and held the graft with K wires. And now the neoglenoid is covered with the graft and the paleoglenoid is, and the, both the surfaces have become coplanar now. You ream over the graft, you get a compressed graft into the glenoid, you put the base plate and it put the stem and that was the x-ray. And now in this case we see that the graft is secure, the thick wedge is posterior because we wanted to correct the posterior version and that was the range of movement after three months. This patient hasn't come back to me because of the lockdown and this was his external rotation but he's doing well. Now coming to the glenoid deformity in the frontal plane which is more common in the rotator cuff tear arthropathy or irreparable rotator cuff tears. Uh, so e, E0 is no erosion, E1 is the deeper central erosion just like A2. E, e, E2 is the superior erosion and E3 is the generalized global uh, uh, glenoid inclination has been changed and E4 is the inferior erosion. So this is a lady who appeared to be, the head was quite medialized. As you can see, the whole of the greater tuberosity is lying under the acromion, whereas at least 15 millimeter of greater tuberosity is out external to the uh, acromion and the offset is also disturbed. As you see, and it is, it looks like an A2 glenoid on the axial cut. Although it looks like an E3 glenoid, but actually this is not a true AP view. And in fact, it was an E1 glenoid. When you got the 2D CT scan, and you could see that this, this was an E1 glenoid. Now, in this case, I used the Pascal Bolus method of finding out the because E1 glenoid is a trap. So I used, I made use of the RSA angle as described by Pascal Bolu. But again, the problem was of the specific instruments. So we did a pre-operative planning and we shaped the trapezoidal graft on the humeral head, six millimeter on the laterally, 12 millimeter medially. And this, this gives you an angle of 12 degrees. Again, you shape the graft on the humeral head. That in this case, because we were planning a bio RSA, so we did a parallel cut instead of the oblique cut so that we don't obtain a wedge, but we obtain a trapezoidal graft. So this was a parallel cut. You put the guide wire into the humerus, which you will put onto the glenoid. You put the reamer of the glenoid onto this. And then you make the inferior cut and you achieve a graft like this. You shape it and this gives you a trapezoidal graft. Then the procedure is same. You hold the graft with the original glenoid with the K wires and then carry on with the procedure. So you see in this, this was the superior glenoid. This was the superior very tight supraspinatus which I did not cut. So the little part of the tuberosity has chipped off but the majority of the posterior cuff has remained intact. And you see, we have restored the offset completely. The graft is there in the axillary view. She was, this was around eight weeks post-surgery. Again, the lockdown has prevented me to get a further workup in this patient.
but this was two months after the surgery. So when we restore the offset, lateral offset, the remaining cuff also, the cuff also gets this length tension relationship and works better. So in conclusion, vault type B2, B3, C and forward E1, E2, E3 granite may be better dealt with bone grafts, augmented base plates. Beware of A2 and E1 glenoid. Use of RSA ankle might be quite useful. Challenges remain to take your pre-operative planning to the operating table with eyeballing the placement of initial guide wire. Now, taking a graft from humeral hair without angle guides can be accomplished by drawing the graft from the humeral hair and taking the oblique cut superiorly for a wedge graft and a parallel cut for a trapezoidal graft. This is for tomorrow morning. I took this opportunity because I've got Kapil and Dr. Pandey and very experienced faculty. This was a case done somewhere else for an uh, irreparable rotator cuff tear, arthropathy, Hamada 3. Um, she had her first surgery done two, three years ago. She fell, she fractured the screws of the base plate, glenosphere dislocated, she was revised at the same place. And now, after the revision in September, she presented to me today without history of fault, not today, I mean a week ago. Uh, and she is now like this. The glenosphere is dislocated. It has escaped superiorly. Patient's other left upper limb is having lymphedema because of breast CA surgery. She only has got this shoulder to work with and she lives alone and takes care of her bedridden husband. She's 73. And this is a fully coated evolutive stem couple. You can't take it out. Raman, so are these screws broken from yes, previous which are in the gland? Yeah, so the, some screws were broken in the first instance when the patient fell, but yeah. uh, the it, they could not be retrieved on the revision, which was done somewhere else. I didn't do it. This is not my case. So those screws could not be retrieved and a fresh base plate and glenosphere was implanted. So first worry is, I call it this the jellyfish sign. So you've had a complete failure of the, the metaglen, which has now come off from the glenoid. So that means the screw fixation was poor or there has been osteolysis. So your first biggest worry here is sepsis. Is she got low-grade sepsis? If you say that this was revised in September, and obviously you have seen the pre-op, you have seen the post-op. Oh, this, this, was, this was revised in May. She presented to the same surgeon in September like this. Okay, so how much time after the revision did this happen? A few months. Yeah. So obviously, so why has it failed? I've got no idea. In this case, well, in this case, she reports no injury after the second revision, after the first revision, no injury. So that is what I'm saying, uh, uh, Raman. The, the reason it has failed is that the screws that were put in into the glenoid, the metaglen fixation was not secure, or the screws have come loose from the bone because of whatever. Either the bone is weak, the screws were not in a good place, or a combination of both. But you still have to rule out sepsis, uh, a low-grade sepsis, as your first cause. So I don't know what your plan is, if it's posted for tomorrow, but I'll be very wary of uh, doing a one-stage procedure here. I, uh, I would definitely do a two-stage procedure. I know there is a problem taking this stem out, but I'll be very, I'll probably do as a two-stage procedure. I want to get all information. I will take multiple cultures, take everything out, clean it up, and then wait to see if I grow any bugs. If you, if you want to, you can so, stop sharing your screen if everybody has seen it. Okay. Then. So the problem here, Raman, is uh, yeah. whatever imaging you do, the information you want will not be adequate because of the metal which is there. So you can't get a good CT or an MRI. No, I, I got a CT done. I just wanted to see it because what all I can see in a CT is probably how deep the glenoid vault is and that's it you can't so see anything even, else in this even then you you will find it difficult but i i would consent the patient i i agree with kapilar i think this is something which you want to do in two stages uh, and i've done two three of them now uh, so when you go in there you take all the metal work out firstly you have to take or the glenoid will probably just fall off uh, with the screws and everything oh, glenoid is already out it's 
it's right under the skin yeah so and also there is one screw which is still there inside the yeah. bone so the taking yeah. that screw out may not be very easy because if yeah. it's well integrated taking it out will be this you leave a bigger hole in the glenoid and i would try and see uh, how the stem lies if the stem is well fixed and you can assess the orientation to see if you put a new glenoid will it reduce and stay there but if you have doubts then you try and attempt to take the stem out too well dr dr pande i i know i've i've used this implant extensively and i had i've burnt my fingers i stopped yeah. using this implant just because yeah, of the fact if, the stem if, is fully that's coated that's what i said it won't be your first come out. choice you try to keep it uh, inside but i mean i've used one of two of them so you will have to do a, a wagner's kind of fracture if you come sure. to it but you try and avoid that but what i will do is even still do is two stage procedure is look at the glenoid i think there will be a lot of bone loss in the glenoid it's, so yes, what yes. i have done in the past is i packed the glenoid does done some impaction bone grafting uh in the glenoid to build no, up is, the base there there lies my question and if you are a couple if we are taking samples for the to rule out infection and then we graft the glenoid yeah you can do that is not a problem okay so the, the, obviously this is not uh, very obviously infected is it raman no 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 so you clinically absolutely no sign samples but i would if there are holes in the glenoid i will build the glenoid i will pack as much bone graft but you have to do impaction bone grafting because if you don't have navigation then you need a reasonable bone stock in your glenoid otherwise you may put a, a glenosphere and 6 months later it will be in your hand that whole glenosphere so you need to build bone stock there and you may have to pack some bone graft and then if you take another x ray 2 3 weeks time you get oh, i I, 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 for, i forgot to inform the faculty the first revision the surgeon had taken a eli crest graft uh um, put it under the glenoid so hang on roman there are issues here this good to get a no, no, get no. these <laughs> packets of graft <laughs> I think the issue with impaction grafting is that will work only if you've got a contained defect. If you've got the rim of the glenoid is intact, then then you will be able to impaction graft it. If you've already in a situation where the previous surgeon had used a graft, you don't know whether you've got a intact rim or not, and then your uh, your your uh, your impaction grafting won't work if you don't have a contained defect. The other issue is I still worry about why has this failed unless the other surgeon was not very competent. there has been some thing that has happened at the screw bone interface which has led to the failure of this prosthesis so early and remember this is this patient's third operation and you've got to have i've just recently done a revision of an elbow where i've grown, grown aspergillus from that elbow so you don't all funny things grow in these artificial joints the other thing about retaining the stem the question is it does this system give you a glenoid base plate which you can use with augments or bone grafts because that is the whole purpose of saving that stem is whether you can use a compatible glenoid yeah it does come in fact this this system does give you a revision base plate which is very nice with additional screw fixation but my my worry is sepsis <coughs> and i ah, sepsis i take it yeah i, I understand i will i will take everything out i will i will do an osteotomy of the humerus i'll take the stem out i'll reconstruct it i'll rebuild it i'll clean it all and then i will go back in 6 weeks later kapil i tried after a, i uh, taking this stem out uh, this is a fully coated stem of evolutis i did a humerotomy and everything it is so well fixed you can bloody take the whole humerus out you can't take this stem out it's fully coated i mean you do do a humer i have done a humerotomy down the length along the bicipital group okay. below the tip of the it doesn't come out but raman i would suggest that yes if it's if it, if you can retain it that's fine if you think the orientation and everything is fine and you can add bits on top of it to build the length you can leave it well, but this, the problem this, this, here is the glenoid the yeah. problem here is the glenoid which has been tampered with twice before yeah, so yes so you yes. take out this and there is not much bone stock left for you to hang another glenosphere on you <laughs> have to that's start worry. to that you have to start looking at you have um, to also plan your graft. the bone graft if the if and if there is not a contained defect and the whole glenoid is gone 
then you just left with the, a large head hemi arthroplasty just as a salvage process or do nothing yep true cta head cta head you have to tell the patient that that mm-hmm. i will it may be a two stage operation yeah one cta head yeah. cta head has got no advantage yeah, yeah, yeah i'm not saying cta come no uh, in if you're uh, not left with anything you may just have to put something in there and come out Yeah. No, no. Hemi is fine. No, some there was a suggestion. Somebody said CT head. So I'm just. No, I did. I did say. I, I I did say Kapil because I've used the CT head of this company in one of my previous patients where two surgeries had failed and you know there was no option. The patient had an axillary palsy. Developed axillary palsy later on. A scapular fracture. I fixed the fracture. I went in again, uh, reduced the dislocation, and eventually on the third attempt, I did the CT head. He's doing fine. Okay. But yeah, I'll take the point. The first point is, of course, this is in the mind. uh the infection so but and dr pande that after i have taken the samples probably i could i could put a graph there uh and see whether i could build up the glenoid and wait or if i find can, absolutely do you clean, have right. access to croutons bone croutons yeah but i have got the elo graft as well ha huh, so you can have a somebody's humeral ephemeral head i have got the allo graft i have got the allo graft right sorry you crunch that and you mix some of her own bone from the other iliac crest mix it all up and if there is a, a def- even if one side is not contained if it's contained three sides you can still impact graft it but if two sides are gone then you can't impact it but if you have a ice cream cone there then it'll be you can do a, a yep. pretty good job with uh impaction bone grafting dr raman yep uh i think we are out of time yeah yeah sure and uh, i think it was uh, a very uh, i think the last uh, dr shirish wanted to say something yeah. uh, after that we will uh, close this discussion and we will have some learning points on reverse shoulder uh, to close with yes dr shirish yeah so uh, in continuation with same discussion i wanted to ask dr raman still we are not sure why this has failed so you said she was operated ca breast are we looking at some secondaries in the glenoid one are we looking at some neuropathic aspect of the joint which has led to this recurrent failure no no no, no. her delta is fantastic no issues delta I, is okay okay so uh, i think uh, yeah. uh, dr raman See, yeah. uh, we would like you to you know uh, take this special case also into aspect and and give some uh, you know some closing points on reverse shoulder its complications as a last resort and right. of course uh, the true indications to do reverse shoulder uh, especially looking at the age group okay so the reverse shoulder is uh, the very very difficult learning curve uh, it looks simple but learning curve is really really bad in my first 45 patients i had a 30% complication rate all recovered by the grace of god i had musculocutaneous nerve injury i had radial nerve injury i had axillary nerve injury all recovered in 3 months time but i had all three and a radial nerve as well so uh, and i that case was for uh, uh, hamada 3 rotator cuff tear arthropathy um best results are still in rotator cuff tear arthropathy but this is as the literature says but if you go back and read what gremont did out of eight cases none was for a rotator cuff tear arthropathy they were all dysfunctional rotator cuff which was three or four a vascular necrosis and things like that but literature has proven that the reverse shoulder replacement the best indication is rotator cuff tear arthropathy number 2 is the irreparable rotator cuff number 3 is the trauma which we are likely to do in india more and more because of the trauma uh, but trauma has got very high complication rate in reverse shoulder replacement as far as the glenoid the glenoid vault you must study because we need to know the orientation in the axial as well as the coronal plane because otherwise the surgery would fail um, the approach um, i don't think deltoid split is a very good approach for in for the beginners i would still say go for the delto pectoral approach because the delto deltoid split approach doesn't give you enough Uh, clearance on the inferior side and you may implant it slightly higher producing scapular notching and perhaps the dislocation this patient was operated by a deltoid split approach two times um the uh, i think i think that's that's about the reverse shoulder replacement and rest everything is biomechanics and reading up but uh, when i was doing my fellowship cormac asked me don't do any 
reverse shoulder replacement for five years. I waited five years, still had 30% complication rate. <laughs> so I, I'm learning, I'm learning. Um, things are improving and we've got better implants now as well. But yes, um, it is not easy, uh, but definitely something which uh, needs to be kept in the armamentarium for the application. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for sharing your experience. Dr. Rajiv, uh, can we close the uh, our webinar? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, on behalf of the GSKC team, I really, really thanks to uh, thankful to uh, my faculty for sparing their time. And uh, I really appreciate that uh, the effort uh, that they put. And it was really a very interactive program. And uh, I wish uh, especially our faculty from UK stay safe and uh, hope we will soon meet offline also. Thanks a lot. Thanks to all audience. And Dr. Dr. Bhatia, you want to say? Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye. Have a nice time. Bye bye. Bye, sir. Bye. Bye, bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Okay,